So before we get started, um, I want to share with you something that it's going to lead into this message. Okay? I need you to hear me. Yes, sir. You're cold. You're cold? Can we turn the air off? Turn the air off. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, now listen, you have to listen because this is important. You are here today because I do not want you to be Christ like. I need Christ to be through you. Now listen, a lot of believers, many of us, are trying to be Christ like. You cannot be Christ like. Now, what's going to happen in this passage, what we're going to begin to see, is there is going to be an entirely different idea that's going to be presented to you. Okay? So let me start by doing this. There is a natural shift from milk to meat in chapter 8. Okay? Now, I asked that interesting question on Facebook earlier. It was, what is the number 8? Okay? Eight is the number of new beginnings. Jesus was raised on the eighth day. The seventh day of the week and then the next day, which was the eighth day, was a brand new start. Okay? So the number eight is of new beginnings. For the first seven chapters of Romans, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us on how to obtain eternal life. Okay? And how to recognize the flesh. Right? Those are all things that that new Christians understand. I know that if Jesus Christ has died on the cross for my sins, he died, he was buried, he rose again three days later, all I did, I believe in his sacrifice for me, now I have eternal life. There's nothing that I can do to earn it. All I can do is accept his free gift, because that's what a gift is, right? So now, with that in mind, this new thought, this new beginning, takes place in chapter 8, because there's going to be a shift. There's that word, shift. Miss Sandra posted it this morning. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? There is a shift, because look at the name of this title, right? The shift. There is a new shift. There is a shift that's going to take place. Okay. From chapter 8 on, the new thought is going to go past eternal life. How are you supposed to live now that you are saved? Are we just supposed to wander around aimlessly with our head in the clouds? No. Right? Now, here we go. Here's the shift. And I need you to see and understand these words because they are mucho, mucho importante, big, fat, very, very hairy, fat deal. Okay. <laughs> you in Christ is the, fo is the focus of the first seven chapters, but Christ in you is the focus of everything that's going to come after that. Now, let me explain this. Okay? God is telling us that it is time to take what we've seen, what we've learned, and what we've believed, and move on. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6, please. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. What verse? Uh, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6. Chapter 6, one. verse 1. Thank you. Remember, lay down the rules are in effect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now, in this passage, I have rules. Lay down the rules are in effect. In this passage, the author is going to present an elementary idea. Okay? From elementary school, that is the beginning. Then you go to middle, then you go to grade, and then later on, right? So he's going to give you an elementary principle. He's going to tell you about the milk of the word. Watch this, verse 1. You ready? Therefore, leaving, see it? Leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. Let us press on toward maturity. This is what we're called to do today. Amen. Everybody got me? Amen. Nobody. Got it? Okay, here we go. 
not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of instructions about washings, laying out of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. All of those things every new believer understands. Okay? Verse 3 is the most important one. And this we shall do, what? Yeah. If, if God, God permits. permits. Now look, God desires for every single one of y'all to get mature. Amen. Amen. God gave you teeth to eat meat. God has given you spiritual teeth to eat spiritual meat. Amen. Okay? Now, coming back to this word order. Let me, I'm going to give you an example. It's going to be really, really bad, but just it's the best one I can come up with. So here we go. <laughs> if I say I am in the car, that means one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But if I were to say the car is in me, that would mean something entirely strangely different though, right? Okay. Anyway, so in the Bible, you in Christ is going to mean one thing. So every time you see you in Christ, it's going to mean one thing, right? But Christ in you is going to mean something entirely different. And remember, the Holy Spirit did not make a mistake in word order. That's right. He didn't flip the words and say, oh, man, I made a mistake. <laughs> Why? Because God doesn't make mistakes, Amen. right? They are cues. Remember? They are cues to let you know what emphasis God is speaking on. So here we go. Let's start this out. In the Bible, whenever you read you in Christ, it is literally speaking about the salvation of your spirit. Remember, you as a person were made in the image of God. God is three. You are three. You have a spirit, a soul, and a body. The body is decaying away. The spirit has been made brand new all when you accepted Christ. The soul is being continually saved as you choose Christ, right? But the salvation of your spirit, what does it relate to? It relates to your eternal life. Listen to me. I don't care how you've lived. If you've accepted Jesus as Savior, when you take your last breath, you are guaranteed eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Guaranteed eternal life. No, there's nothing that you can do. You, if you accept Christ and then you fall away, guess what? You still have eternal life. But something's going to take place in the middle, okay? which we know much about, right? But listen, when God gives you a gift and you accept that gift, you can take that gift and throw it in the garbage. But listen, it's still your gift. Amen. It, doesn't, it doesn't diminish God's gift to you. You accept it. Now, that's you in Christ. And we're going to see this example. But now let's flip what, if, what happens when the Bible says Christ in you? Well, this is talking about the salvation of your soul. This is your day-to-day -day struggle. When that person cuts you off in traffic, <laughs> when you go to Walmart, whatever the case may be, this is when the flesh wants to rise up inside of you and get all nasty-like. Right? That is the struggle that every single believer in Christ faces. Right? Is there anybody who doesn't face it except for Marianne? Because we know that she's got the perfect thing going on. There. Right? right? But now watch. The salvation of your soul is literally connected to your millennial life. Meaning your inheritance. What inheritance? God has an inheritance for you. When you stand in the judgment seat, he's going to ask you, how faithful did you live the life that I gave you? If you are found faithful, guess what? Inheritance. Inheritance comes with rewards. That's what we've been looking at over these last several months. All of this is tying together. Isn't it interesting, though, that he's bringing it out now? For people to see now? When everything seems to be going to H-E double hockey sticks in a handbasket? Now he wants to make an emphasis on this? Yes. Now, why? Because too many believers in Christ don't live this way. They don't even understand what Christ in you is. They just think, I'm just supposed to go out the door and make the best choices I can. I'm supposed to be Christ-like. No. Nope. You're literally supposed to let Christ live through you. Now, let's keep going. Here we go. 
Watch what happens because you're literally going to see this. Pay attention to the words that you read in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Okay, here we go. Lighthouse rules. Lighthouse rules. It's not that there. The pages in Darwin. Just kidding. Just kidding. Thank you. 1494. Here we go. Now, pay attention to the words that you hear because it's important. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. So what is he talking about? If I'm, if I'm accepted Christ as my Savior, there is now no condemnation for me anymore. I'm never going to, I'm never going to Hades. I'm never going to the eternal lake of fire. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. Now watch this. In Christ Jesus, at the moment that you accepted Christ as Savior, when you believed that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for your sin, and that he was buried, rose again three days later, at that moment, God placed you into Christ Jesus. Amen. Because of this, you now have the guarantee of eternal life. Yes, Jesus. I don't care what any other of my peers are telling you. It is a guarantee. John 3.16 has got no clause. That's right. Nope. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life. There you go. It's done. It's over. That's it. It's finished. All right? So now watch. You in Christ is a finished work. Done, kaput, finished. Go back to Romans chapter 6, verse 11 for a second. Now, I'm going to show you three different verses. Yes? Um, what happens if you're part of the mafia, but you already accepted Christ as your Savior, but you went ahead and became the mafia? What trumps? Huh? What trumps? Being uh, already asked to be saved. There you go. If I've accepted Christ, it doesn't matter what I do. But now watch this, though. When I stand in the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to have some explaining to do. And I'm probably going to miss out on the inheritance that is mine. That's every single one of yours. See, this is the thing. God wants you to understand what it means to have Christ in you. Amen. Because okay? you're already in Christ. It's a finished work. Romans 6, 11. Now pay attention to Christ in you. Or you in Christ. Okay, here we go. Verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. Where? In Christ Jesus. Okay? So now that I'm a believer in Christ Jesus, I'm dead to sin. That's what the Bible's telling me. I'm not making this up. 1 Corinthians 1. We've seen this verse plenty of times, but it's so important. Keep coming back to this verse. Understand what God is telling you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Y'all, I'm looking for freedom today. Mm. Yeah. You already got it. Amen. Thank you. Because I'm living out of victory. Not for it. All right, here we go. But by his doing, that's God's doing, you are where? Lighthouse rules. Lighthouse rules. Lighthouse rules are in effect? Sorry. Okay, go ahead. You sure? Okay. One, verse 30. But by his doing, so that's by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now listen, it doesn't say Christ is in you. It says you are in Christ Jesus. Got that? Big difference. Because once you've, once you've accepted Christ, it's a finished work. Your spirit is made brand new by the Holy Spirit coming to live within inside of you. One more place. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Bible grill. Bible grill. I said Galatians, y'all. You did. We don't judge. Oh, thank you. I was trying to remember. I was going back to my New York days when we were Colossians. Colossians? Colossians. My mom called them something else, but I'm not going to say what they were. Okay, Colossians 3. Galatians 3, 28. Some of y'all know what I'm just back right there. Okay. Galatians 3, 28. Now remember, we're looking for in Christ Jesus. Ready? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, listen to me. Every single time he mentions 
you in Christ Jesus, it's a done thing. There is no more of this anymore because you are all right now. Amen. Amen. Okay, now let me expand on that just a little bit. Catholics who believe that Jesus died for their sins, yep, them Amen. too. Listen, man put denominations on it. That's Amen. right. Man put a label on it. God said, what are you doing? Man said, I don't know, we think we're smart. God said, you're really not. <laughs> you're really making a mess of this thing. Okay? It's simple, but we, we've caused the problem. Yeah. All right, now, let's switch. So it's a finished work. Everybody got that? Yeah. Okay. You are in Christ Jesus. You can't be taken out. Because who has the power to take themselves out of Christ's hand? No one. Does Satan have the ability to take no. you out of God's hand? No. Are you sure? By yes. no means. Very much. Now, amen. John 10, 28. Now, Christ in you. Now, watch what's going to happen. This is a process. Why is it not be a process? Because that's the way it is. Right? Go to, you're in Galatians, go to chapter 4, verse 19. Galatians 4, verse 19. Galatians 4, 19. Now, now watch. From, for the rest of these verses, we want to focus, we want to hear Christ in you. Okay, you're already in Christ. It's a done deal. Okay? But now there's Christ in you. Watch this. This is going to be a process. My children, with whom I am again in I am again in labor until what? Christ is what? Born in you. In you. Till Christ is formed in you. Now does that sound like a completed thing? No. That sounds like there's something I'm still working on. Right? Because that's the whole idea. Christ in you is a process. See, the problem is, when we get saved, we think, I should have it all put together. Mm. Where do we get that cockamamie idea from? The dudes that stand behind these things yeah. that tell you. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not true at all. You have to understand your place in Christ and understand your place of Christ in you. Here we go. Paul is saying that he wants Christ to be formed in them. Verse 20 actually alludes to this. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone. I'm perplexed about you. He, he gave them the truth, but then they went back to man's ways of being religious. Y'all, come on. How many religious churches are there out there? Tons. Does God want them to live that way? No. Religion is rule following. Amen. Christianity is relationship. Amen. Amen. I do not live with my beloved because I am following her rules. Well, I am so. But <laughs> I have a relationship with her because that's now what do I do? I I compromise. I do the things because I love her. Amen. See, that's what a relationship is. Okay? Amen. Now, here we go. He says this word formed in verse 19. Formed. This is the Greek word morphu. Okay? It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's what happens to a butterfly. It's the same word. Understand, at one point in time we were in that little cocoon, but the process goes on, and when the process is completed, what happens to that caterpillar? Sprouts its wings. Thank you, Miss Della. And it becomes a butterfly. <laughs> All right. So this is what God is trying to form in you. He's trying to form a brand new life. In you. Christ in you. See, Christ living through you. Now, why do we need change? Because we have lived, and some of us still do, according to the flesh for so long that it becomes a habit and we respond in fleshly ways remember what we talked about learned responses we all have different things that happen and they trigger us anybody got a trigger oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay a couple of you do okay. we have triggers right and when that thing happens you just like automatically snap 
Yep. Right? Yes. yes. Yep. It's a learn response. It is. What did we learn last week? That's not who you are anymore. But when we believe what the flesh says, and we adhere to that trigger, we're literally living a lie. Amen. Okay? Now watch this. Now, as an inward change, there is nothing we can do to affect the change. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that Christ living through me is something I have no control over? That is. Yes. That's exactly what I'm telling you. There's nothing that you can do. Y'all, listen, y'all can go home and try to pray 1,500 million prayers, okay? And say, I want, I want Christ to be formed in me. I want Christ to be formed in me. And he's just going to sit there and say, listen, you have to take your hands off of this. Because this is something he does. What, is the, what does the caterpillar have to do to become a butterfly? It morphs within that cocoon by what naturally takes place. Y'all understand where we're going, right? I'm not talking about after we're done here. I'm talking about where we're going. Where we're going. Everybody knows we're all going someplace, right? Here we go. 2 Corinthians 13. Watch how this connects. Remember, Christ in you. We're looking at a process. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Go left one book. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. And again, I want you to pay attention to the words Christ in you. And when you hear it, see what's going on in that verse. This is why we say context determines the meaning. Okay? Now this is interesting. Okay? Watch what it says. Test yourselves. I don't want to. Too bad. <laughs> Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Now, I'm going to explain that in just a second, so hang on. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is what? In you. Watch, look at the difference. Okay? Unless indeed you fail the test. Okay, wait a minute. Is he saying that... If I haven't made all good decisions, then I'm not going to heaven? No. 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 Because what did he just say? Christ in you. It's a completely different thing. He's talking about a completely different process. Watch this. Why would I fail the test? Because I'm not in the faith. This is not saying that you are somehow become unsaved. Paul is writing to believers here. Why is he telling a believer, hey, test yourself to see if you're in the faith? Why? He wants them, God wants us to test ourselves to recognize if we are walking according to the flesh or if we're walking according to the spirit. Amen. Walk by faith, faith. and not by sight. Test yourself. So what is he saying? Hey, take a look at what you're doing in your life. Take a look at the decisions that you're making and ask yourself, are you living according to the flesh? Or are you living according to the Spirit? Now, if you are honest with yourself before God, you'll get the answer. Sometimes I'm not going to like the answer. But it just shows me this. God loves me so much, He don't want me to stay in that state. Amen. He won't hang out at that door. Okay? So now, here we go. One more place. One more place. And I'm going to try my very best to read this normal. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. That's right. Colossians chapter 1, that's right. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 1, 27. Again, you are looking for the words Christ in you. You're not looking for you in Christ because we've already settled that. We're looking, about the, we're looking at the process that we're going under here. Okay? Now watch this. Can I get in on the joke? Or? No. I, I, oh, you I know. I, I know, because I, I hear, I, I hear yeah. Pastor Whipple every time he reads it. Every time I read it. Okay. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you Gentiles, which is Christ, what? In you. The what? The whole oh. glory. Raise your hand if you are hoping to go to heaven. Thank you! Ain't none of you raised your hand! Woo! Because you know it is a guarantee. But if I'm hoping for glory, what am I hoping for? My glory is my inheritance. Amen. The of That's it, the kingdom of heaven! Your inheritance! Listen to me. How do I get it? By Christ. 
Christ in you. That's him living through you. Guess what? You got to be like this. I used to do this when I was a kid. Be riding down. There was this really, really, really long hill. I would bicycle up to the top of the hill. My huffy banana seat. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for relating, okay? I'm at the top of the hill, I'm head down that hill, yeah. and I'd be going, my feet would go up, and yeah. my hands would go like yeah. this, yeah. and I would just be, yeah. and then that dumb bush would come right in my way. <laughs> <laughs> that is the picture of Christ in you. Wow. You're taking your hands off, yeah. and you're trusting yeah. that he's going to be in control. See, that's our issue. Because listen to me, you want to know what the flesh is going to tell you? He doesn't know what he's doing. God doesn't know what he's doing. He's going to make life terrible for you. Okay, here we go. I want to know how you got to do that. Oh. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't. You want to know, wait a minute, what did she say? I didn't even. She wants to know how you got your foot back out and your feet back on the hills. You put it on the bush. Faith land, right? All right, now, with all of this in mind, this is a long setup, but with all of this in mind, come back to Romans chapter 8. Okay? Now watch what happens. Because I got back on the bunk. I had to get a step back on. <laughs> you said it. I did say it, didn't I? Just let it right out there. Yeah. All right, Romans chapter 8. Lighthouse rules. I'm not there. Okay. So now, you already saw what verse 1 is about, right? He's telling you, there is now no condemnation because you've accepted Christ. If you've accepted Christ, your right, your guarantee is eternal life. That never gets taken away. I don't care how you live afterwards, it never gets taken away. I'm going to say that again. I don't care how you live afterwards, it never gets taken away. But your inheritance is at stake. Amen. See, now watch the shift. Watch what Paul does. Okay? Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life, where? In Christ. In Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's what we read in Romans chapter 7. Yeah. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh, in the likeness, not the same. In the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he, con he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I need to say that last part again. Why? Because the Lord told me to during the middle of the week. Listen very carefully to me. Remember when I left off last week, I said I was in the presence of greatness? Because each and every one of you have the Holy Spirit within you. Amen. That in and of itself is greatness. Okay? Listen to me. You walk in the Spirit. The only other way to walk is in the old nature. The old nature is dead. Listen to me. This is what people will do. They'll read this verse and they'll say, Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Sometimes. Is there a sometimes in that passage? No, no. Listen to me. God is trying to cue you into something. He's trying to let you know something. You really don't have a good enough view of who you who you really are. Amen. As a believer in Christ, do you have the power of Christ? No. Yes. No. The power of Christ right, resides within you. Because the Holy Spirit right, resides within you. As a believer in Christ, do you have the ability to confess a fleshly decision and receive forgiveness from God? Absolutely. Right? Now watch. Jesus told us we had that. That's exactly right. You're going to have it. Here's the reminder from the Holy Spirit of what He has shown us already. We are new creatures. We don't have to try to be new creatures. We already are new creatures. We are no longer to live in the sin nature because it's dead. But He also reminds us that we had nothing to do with our salvation. I don't care how many prayers you pray. There is nothing that you did. The only thing that you can say is, I believe. I believe. Now, here we go. You must reckon this last part of this passage as truth. 
That's what Romans 6, 11 was saying. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin. Remember, that word consider is an accounting term. If I have $1 and $1 and I put it in the bank, how many dollars do I have? Yeah. Unless you're the government, you've got $150 million. <laughs> But one and one is two, right? <laughs> right? One and one is two. Now look, I can put in my bank account, I've got five. But what is the truth? I have two. And that's what God is saying. You are dead to sin. It's, it's fact. Write it down. Consider it as dead. Now let's move on to verse 5. For those who are, a little behind, for those who are according to the flesh, set their what? Minds. Okay, hang on to that word because that's going to be mucho, mucho importante too. Here we go. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. Right. Here we go. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Now here we go. Here we go. Paul is still speaking to believers. There are those who live according to the flesh. But unlike Paul's irritation in chapter 7, these believers enjoy it. I need you to understand. There are some believers who they're okay to live in the flesh. They don't see a problem. They think they're supposed to be in control. But that's not the way that God would have it. Why would God, who has given you a brand new life, want you to live at the old place? Especially when that place no longer exists. If I lived in a house and that house got torn down and I moved to a new house, I'm not going back to the old house that's been torn down and just sitting there and crying. I'm going to enjoy living in my new house. That's got some pretty cool rules. Or rooms. See? Thank you. Okay. But now this is what I need you to see. Okay? Because this is important. Because people are be like, I don't know if I understand. Listen. Paul's focus is on your mind. He's still talking to believers, right? His focus is on your mind, not your spirit. He's already passed that. He's already, he already understands you're already going to heaven. But what he's trying to tell you now is, where is your mind? Let me put it to you this way. Think about what you've been thinking about. <laughs> At church? <laughs> <laughs> this is an important distinction. Because if we are talking about the Spirit, it may seem like I could lose my salvation, right? But that's not what he's talking about. All through these, these verses, all he says is your mind, your mind, your mind. What kind of mind do you have? You have the mind of Christ. Do we always use it? No. 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 Sometimes we agree with the flesh. Why? Because we have learned responses that we agree with. And we make those things true in our lives. Now, here we go. You ready? Yes. What controls your mind controls you. If you are constantly thinking about taking a drink of alcohol, do you think you're going to get it? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. If you are constantly thinking about getting back at that person who did right. you wrong, yeah. think about it. Yep. Yep. Literally. What controls your mind controls you. Now, if somebody does you wrong and you say, the Lord would have me forgive this person. Even though it's tough, that's what God called you to do. Right? Yeah. Well, listen to me. He doesn't want you to do it. I don't want to hear it. He wants to do it through you. See, that is the mystery of godliness. It is a mystery because I can't do it. He does it through me. Y'all have had that experience. Yes, ma'am. And I learned this the hard way. When you truly have asked God to, to forgive someone, then you have to forget about what they did. You can't ever remember. It's overdone with God. I used to tell my kids, you know, if, if your sister says she's sorry for what she did, then you lose the right to ever mention it again. It's over, done, and gone. And we have to be that same way when God forgives others for us. 
Now, yeah. if the enemy tries to bring it back to your mind, what can you do? Ah, I've already forgiven the person for that. You're trying to trip me up. That's right. That's not of you, God. That's of the flesh. I give that to you, and I ask you to purge for me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, your soul, that your um, beginning, uh, Christ in you is for the salvation of your soul, which is your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. Bingo. And that's exactly what God's trying to change it to. Isaiah says to his thoughts. His that's will. that's his exactly. So Christ in you is literally Christ. Who's already in there, coming out. Amen. Okay? That's the whole picture. In these verses, the Holy Spirit is pointing us to the difference between the carnal Christian and the spiritual Christian. They exist. The carnal Christian is the person who lives according to the flesh. Ah, those terrible carnal Christians. Careful, because you act like them lots of times. Amen. And I don't care who you are. Every single one of us gets tripped up by the flesh. Can I get a witness? Yeah. See? The mature believer in Christ understands when they see somebody who's struggling, man, I am praying for that person. Not, I'm praying for that person. Mm -hmm. I'm praying for that person yeah. because I know exactly where they're at. Amen. If, listen to me. If you put yourself on a pedestal, it's all you don't want to take. Pride comes before a fall. Listen to me. The hardships and stuff, we talked about this, the hardships and stuff that come into your life, they're for a testimony. They're for God to work through you so that on the other side you can say, look what God did. Because if it was up to me, I'd be in jail. <laughs> you have to understand, none of us is perfect, but we have Christ in us. We have to choose. Ah, there it is. You have to choose. And that's exactly what we see here. And that's a second by second, minute by minute. Bingo. Bingo. So, now, here we go. A little test. Ready? Not like a test test, but... <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, it's April. Who gives almost April? Who gives tests in April? <laughs> the school system. The school system. <laughs> right, here we go. What is your mind set on? Listen. You. Your job. Your life. Your kids, your desires, your money, your things, your time. Stop. Abraham test. Ready? Think of something you care a lot about. Of, a lot, a lot about. If God called you to give it up for him, would you? Don't see, got real quiet. Yes, I know why. Because there are certain things that we attach to. Listen to me. It can even be a loved one. Yeah. That we attach to and we say, I cannot live without. God will prove to you, yes, you can. Yeah. Und Look at me. What God is trying to tell you is he wants nothing to take his place. That's right. he, now listen, he knows it's a struggle. Because look, some of us, when we think of our families, we think they have to come first. Our family has to come first. My kids have to come first. If you're putting your family, your spouse, your children before God, you have the order wrong. And it's going to be terrible for you for a long, long time until you make it right. You must put God first. Now, when you put God first, everything else seems to fall into place. Right. Not by what you're doing, because you're like, whoa, what is happening here? <laughs> because God is at work. Okay? Now, here we go. If your mind is set on the flesh, which is you, okay? Anytime that your mind is set on you, you cannot please God. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. It just means that there is a hindrance in your relationship with, in fellowship with him at that moment. Amen. Okay? ATM. At that moment. Okay? So. Let me put it another way. If our mind is set on us, we cannot please God. Remember, your life, it's not about you. It's about them. Now, what do I mean by that? Not giving up everything that I own so that they can be comfortable. It is God through me. Remember what fruit does? When fruit comes off of the branch, 
Who's it for? It's for them. It's not for me. The branch doesn't say, oh. It gives away. That's what God wants to do. Okay? Hebrews 11, 6, 6 says, without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. Right. So you have to live by faith. Faith in who? Jesus. Christ, Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Faith that Christ Jesus will do what? Do what he does through me. Amen. Okay? Now watch what verse 9 says. However, I love however. <laughs> however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Remember, he's talking about your mind, not your spirit. Hang on. Verse 10. And if Christ is where? In, in you. you. See it? Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now watch this. He says dwells. This is the Greek word oikeo. On your paper it's blue and it's supposed to be blue. Okay? <laughs> I was <laughs> What? Hey, I was for you, Pastor. I was asked. Hey, I think you gave us your No. Okay, now watch. Oikeo comes from the Greek word meaning a house. Okay? So, what it's saying is, it's to inhabit one's abode. We've actually seen this word in Romans 7.17. Yes. Flip over there real quick. Watch. Romans 7.17. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin, which what? See it? Verse 18. For I know that nothing good is in my house. Listen to me. What did Jesus say? You have the flesh and you have the spirit. When you got saved, ain't none of y'all got perfect. Because that flesh still remains until we either get raptured or we die. Once that takes place, flesh is gone, stays here. Listen, it, knows, it knows that. And it, it, that's why it wants control. Okay? So now watch this. Here we go. This Greek word means one is in that abode, but listen, they can literally leave or be forced out. Okay? There's a big contrast. That's why it's in yellow. Turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. I'm positive. I hollered at it, girl. Colossians 2, verse 9. <laughs> Poor Miss Steffi, she thought for sure that I had left you by servant notes because she's like, this is a yellow one. <laughs> but it's supposed to be that one. <coughs> now watch. You're going to see the same word, okay? The same Greek word, but it's going to have a prefix on the front of it. Because this word dwells is going to be talking about Jesus Christ. And how God dwells with Jesus Christ. Mm. Do you think Jesus can kick God out? Yeah. No. So you would expect a completely different word here. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, there is one. Amen. Go figure. Here we go. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity, what? Dwells. See that word dwells? This is the Greek word kat oikeo. Same Greek word, but there's a prefix on the front. That kata is an intensive. The intensive literally means that it's fixed and it cannot be changed. Why? Because Christ and God are one. Amen. But this is not the word that Paul's talking about for you. He's saying that you've got this thing inside of you that literally can be kicked out. When he's talking about the flesh, do you all know you have the power to literally kick it out of the house? Yeah. You know how? You say, no. God, take this away. That's, that's the picture. So this word is a contrast. All right? Now, the next word, belong, means to be or to remain. Okay, this is important. The idea here is you are remaining in Christ. Let me come back. Romans chapter 8. We 
you going back to it? Yeah, I'm going back to the I lost my place, I should have left it. Okay, verse 9, the end of verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. Okay, so in, in verse 9 he talks about dwells, but it's that same dwelling of the flesh that's there, right? Mm -hmm. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, meaning he's in control. If This is about control of your mind, okay? Yeah. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, when I read that word, the first thing I thought of was, man, that means I lost my salvation. No. It means remain. What did Jesus say in John 15, verse 4? Abide, Abide in me, me, and I in you. Ooh, I'm sorry. Wait. Abide in me, and I in you. Ah, now we know what Jesus was talking about. Because in John 15, all he's talking about is fruit. Bearing. Here he's talking about the mind. So I wonder, is there a connection between what my mind does and the spiritual fruit I produce? Yeah. 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 Yep, you got it. Now, let's move on to verse 10. Where he says, and if Christ is in you, so remember, he's talking about the process, meaning Christ is in control. If Christ is in you, though the body of is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Christ is in you. Meaning, you have not forced the Holy Spirit out because your mind is set on the flesh. Pastor? Yes, ma'am. We go back to the very beginning of that verse. Verse 9? Or verse 10? Verse 10. Yep. Read it again slowly. Okay. And if. Thank you. What does that imply? I got a choice. I, I have a choice. I can choose to listen to my flesh, or I can choose to abide by the Spirit. And literally, you're not following rules. You're literally allowing God to live through you. It's not about you getting up and white knuckling it all day long. It's about you having faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen. It doesn't say without you white knuckling it all through the day and not, and not cussing. No, it says without faith, it is impossible to please God. I wasn't looking at anybody in general. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, <laughs> all right, the spirit is alive. Life, the abundant life that Christ promised us, that spirit is alive to bring Christ in control. It's available to you. There is nobody here who has accepted Christ who can say, I don't have the Holy Spirit to be able to be in control of my life. Wrong. That would literally mean that the Holy Spirit is not in you. But Pastor, the Bible tells the flesh is the Spirit will not operate where the flesh is working. That's exactly right. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. If, if I'm living according to the flesh, where's the Spirit? Outside my abode. However, what does the Bible also say? Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. If I'm in the abode of the Holy Spirit, the flesh can't, I've kicked it out. See, that's the choice. That's the connection that we have to, now look, that's everything that Paul has led up to at this point. He literally told you in Romans chapter 7 how much he struggled with this very same thing. This is Paul, guys. Paul, the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul. Yeah, him. He struggled. Pastor, it, it, it's an abomination to God. It's what the carnality of man. Yes. Yes. He tells you there's a whole litany of Timothy and Colossians with, uh, where we, you know, it's like drawing a line in the sand. We're going to walk by flesh and not by spirit. We're, God says sin will set, that we're dead in God. We've got to understand that when we stand against God, we're dead. Yep. God doesn't have no interaction with us when we desire to sin against Him. Our fellowship is hindered when we sin. But that, and that's terrible, isn't it? Because we can never get back again. Yes, yes we can! Because we have the confession of our sin. We can confess. All of, now listen to me. This is what confession is. This is not sitting down next to a dude telling him everything that I did wrong. Because I tried that once and I got in trouble for it. Confession is this. Confession is, you know what, Lord? I did this thing. 
and it was wrong. Amen. You've pricked my heart that it's wrong. And now I repent from that thing. That's the key. Yeah. Because you can say I repent all day long, but in the back of your mind you're like, I'm going to do that tomorrow too. Mm -hmm. That's willful sin. And you get, yes, ma'am. You know what I love about the Lord? I love that um, that He, even though we, you know, He can let us go and go and go, and we just keep pushing it aside and living the way we want to live and not being focused on that. But the wonderful thing about the Lord is He won't leave us alone. There's just something there that just <clears throat> gnaws at you and gnaws at you. And I think you can just keep pushing that back and pushing that back. But you can only push it back for so long, and you break at that point, and that's what God wants us to do. get us back in fellowship right. with Him. Right. But I love that about the Lord. See, and that's what true love does. Yes. yes. They won't leave you alone. They won't quit on you. That's right. And even when you're at the end and your face is in the gutter, when you look up, you will see His hand. Amen. Amen. Sometimes that's the only hand you see whatsoever. And sometimes he's got to get you to that place. You know, everybody else can give up on you, and they can say, you know, it's a lost cause. It's never a lost God cause. never gives up on you. Amen. Here we go, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells, indwells you now. I need you to see something. Two different Greek words here. Yes. Okay? At the beginning of verse 11, you see oiko. Okay? Now, dwells in you. At the beginning of verse 11, it's that oiko, which is I can kick somebody out of the house or I can keep it in the house. Okay? Meaning, if the Holy Spirit has control over your mind, listen to me. This is what this is all about. Paul is trying to tell you, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of your mind. You can try as you want to, just like Ms. Sherry was saying, to push it out, push it out, push it out. But he's going to keep coming after you. Now, he will also give life to your mortal bodies. Remember, I already have the promise of eternal life, so that's not the life he's talking about. He must be talking about a different kind of life. Maybe a life with rewards and an inheritance. Here's the connection. When you allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of your body, you are literally walking by faith. And if I am literally walking by faith, that means when I stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ, I will hear, you will hear, well done. Those are the words every believer in Christ wants to hear. Here we go. He's talking about your inheritance. He's talking about you ruling and reigning with him in the kingdom. Now, you will have a glorified body. But will it happen before the kingdom of heaven comes? Or a thousand years after? There is a connection here. In order to gain your inheritance, to gain your rewards... You must allow the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to be in control. Now, the second word, His Spirit, who indwells, is literally the Greek word oikeo, but there's an in on the front. That in is an intensive meaning in. Here we see that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Listen to me. He's always there. <clears throat> you don't have to question it. Listen to me. Even if the enemy tells you God is not with you. I had a conversation with a brother in Christ this morning who is going through all kinds of chaos. His kid's sick. He's got issues. He's sick. He's got things going on in his job that are going to take him away from his family for over a year. All of these things came at him at once. And he's like, what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, you're not doing anything wrong. Welcome to the test of, is God with me in the valley or not? Well, well Pastor, there's one, one thing you've got to realize. If you're not listening, if you don't listen, he can't do you got to be listening. But if, I hear him. 
But if I'm listening and if my mind is set on Christ, listen to me. Sometimes God gets you to the frustrating point. Remember we talked about that? He gets you to the point where you're frustrated. Why? So that you will understand that He really is in control. That He really is with you. That's exactly right. The Holy Spirit is always there. Last verse, verse 12. Here we go. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we are living according to the flesh, you must die. Now, that die is a present tense verb. What does that mean? Paul said it this way. I die daily. daily. What is he telling? When you find out that you're living according to the flesh, don't let it linger. Get rid of that thing right then and there. Amen. Lord, this is wrong. Take this away from me. And he does every single time. Amen. Now watch what he says in the last half. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now look, he's not talking about your eternal life because that's already a done deal. Let me see the stars. That was weird. Hey. It really is. It's hard. Are you good? I'm good. But this word, you will live, future tense. Amen. He's not talking about your eternal life. Why? What if I told you that as a believer in Christ, you literally have eternal life right now? Right. Amen. Be like, Duh. All right. It's true. Right. Because if I'm in Christ, Christ is in you. Right? Yeah. If Christ, amen, brother. So if I'm in Christ, Christ is eternal. If Christ is eternal, I must be eternal. Yeah. That means I have an everlasting life right now. But he wants to give me a different life soon. Look, right. here's the shift. From chapters 1 through 7, Paul's talking about getting you into eternal life. <laughs> Once you're there, now he's telling you, look, this life that you have is for something. God desires for each and every believer in Christ to rule and reign, to attain their inheritance, to receive their rewards. It's not up to us to judge who does and who doesn't. Amen. The thing is, it's on us. How do, we, how, do we, how do we rectify what God tells us? When God says to us, hey, this thing is an issue. This thing needs to change. Give me a minute to think about that. <laughs> no. I can't talk about that. Right now. I can't talk about that right now. No. I know I have heart. eternal life. The future life is the one that is to come. Here we go. When you stand before Christ, as a believer in Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, which is for believers only, so if you've accepted Christ, guess what? You have a judgment coming. Point. Well, that's not fair. Yeah, it is. Because yeah. God kind of set it up that way. Right? Now, at that judgment seat of Christ, am I being judged <coughs> whether or not I'm saved? No. no. What am I being judged for? Your what works. Works. My, my works. What I've allowed him to do through me. Remember, 1 Corinthians 3. What it's talking about is your works. It's not talking about whether or not you're saved. Because only a saved person can be there. You've got the foundation of Jesus Christ. So at that judgment seat of Christ, which is only for believers, now I'm talking about the great white throne, that's later. When he judges your works, not your sins, Hallelujah. and you are found faithful, at that moment you will receive your glorified body, you will receive your rewards, you will receive your inheritance. You will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And then when the new heaven and the new earth comes, you will reign with him with all of those things forevermore. Listen to me. There's a lot at stake down here. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's just 60, 70 something years, there is now a lot at stake. This is what Paul is saying when he speaks in verse 12. We are obligated. Amen. God did not choose for you to get into this place, sit in that seat, hear his word, just to go la la all the way home. <laughs> he has, listen to me. He is entrusting you this precious truth. That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. That God Almighty is trusting you and I. Oh, if he only knew. But he does. He does. We can't, we can't live this life 
based on how we see ourselves. We must live this life based on how he sees us. And what has he done? He has literally entrusted the truth of the kingdom with you. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to me. When I talk to George about this in Minnesota, this is the part where the both of us start tearing up. Yeah. How? Why me? <laughs> Why me? Don't know. Just is. Because God knows something about you that you don't. Because I, we are all in the presence of greatness. Because the Holy Spirit resides within each and every one of us. Listen to me. Last thing I want to tell you, don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. Amen. 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 Don't let anybody. I don't care what choices you make. I don't care if they're terrible. You have Christ. You have all that you need. Amen. Yes, sir. So, basically the lesson is saying we should focus on our rewards and our, and our um, not on our sins. Don't focus on the rewards. No, I meant, I meant um, not that which and a person who comes to the Lord is focused on their sins at first, but then afterwards he's teaching us to focus on the life. On him. That's it. The life of him in us. That's the key. Amen. That, now, here, that's, that's a trick of the enemy. Ooh, you're gonna get some rewards. Then you're living for the rewards. You're living for the wrong. Yeah, I, I didn't mean. I didn't mean. Live for Christ, and, and then He lives through you. Let's pray. My God, my God, I thank you. I thank you that you have counted each and every one of us to receive this truth. This this is not some kind of a coincidence or an accident that we're here. Lord God, you, you are literally shifting the atmosphere in our lives. Because from this point forward, Father, there are believers in God, <coughs> brothers and sisters, who are stuck in a whirlpool. They are trying to live the best Christian life that they can, and they're getting nowhere. God, you are calling us to show them Christ in you, the hope of glory. Lord God, I pray right now that you would bless my brothers and sisters in Christ. That each and every one as they go, that they would see their importance. That they would understand what has been given to them. Oh, yes, Jesus. oh Lord, I just feel so compelled to bless these people. They are your people. They are the ones that you have chosen in this last day to spread the truth of your word. Set the captives free, people. It's time to let the prisoners out. Amen? Amen. Oh, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this day. And it's in Jesus Christ's glorious name that I pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.